In this video, we are going to address the score system for the game. What we're going to do is set up the ability to calculate and store the scores that one or more players have achieved while playing the game, and then store that number in such a way that the score screen can read it and display it. Okay. Because at this point, we've already got the score screen created, but we don't have the actual score information shown on that screen because we don't yet have any information for scores. Now, how is our score going to be handled? Is it going to be a percentage of notes hit? Is it going to be some sort of numeric value that just gets applied? In this case, it's going to be a simple uh, floating point value. Okay. We're going to have a value of 1 to indicate that we hit 100% mm -hmm. and then some smaller fraction if that was if we hit fewer than 100% of the notes. Okay. Really the idea is that we'll take um, the number of notes that the user hit, divide that by the total number of notes in the song to sure. yield a percentage. So in the end we're going to be doing a, a percentage as opposed to, you know, you just scored 338,000 points. Exactly. And the idea is that this could be used as a base to where once you decide on a point-based scoring system, mm -hmm. you could use this percentage as one of possibly many elements to drive an overall score. Gotcha. Now what we need to do is we need to be able to both store and calculate the score itself. Now, the score calculation is going to be done inside of the game screen. Since it's the game screen, that's going to be able to look out for when song events happen, things like when the song ends. So whenever a song ends, the, screen, the game screen can calculate the score. But we need to store that information in a place where the score screen can access it. So we'll actually jump over to our global state class, and we'll put together a field to hold scoring information. We'll drop down a public static field, and we'll make a float array, because we, of course, we want to be able to store multiple scores in the case of running in multiplayer mode. So we'll make a float array, and we'll call this array scores. And then we'll turn around using a field initializer, we'll create a new float array, and then we'll specify the number in max players as the number of elements we have in the scores array. What that means is regardless of whether we're in single player mode or in multiplayer mode, scores is always going to have enough elements to hold the maximum number of players. Okay. And the idea is that if we're in single player, we'll simply only read element zero. Then if we're in multiplayer, then we'll read both elements. But either way, we'll set up enough storage space to hold both scores. All right, now we can move over to the song class and we're going to set up a scenario where we count the number of notes that have been hit and store that value in each song instance. Because as we're going through and notes are being hit, we need to record the fact that those have been hit to give a total, then we can use that to calculate the score. We'll do this inside of the song class. So up here under core, we'll bring up our base song, and we'll add a field called hit count. It'll be a public integer, hit count, and then we can set up an explicit initializer of zero. Again, the reason for storing this inside of the song instance is it will make it easier to, um, uh, basically easier to find inside of the game screen. Mm -hmm. So rather than have a secondary array in the game screen itself like we did with songs, it would be easier just to package this along with the player that it belongs to. Now while we're in the song class. Let's also address the reset method because whenever we call reset the idea is to get the song back into its initial state and initially after a song has been loaded no notes are going to be hit so we want to make sure we reset the hit count to zero especially since we're looping through the notes note by note and setting hit to false mm -hmm. we want to make sure that hit count reflects that number. So that means we can take this dot hit count and set that to zero whenever reset is called. Gotcha. So now the song really has been reset. All right, moving on from here, let's load up our song play class. Inside of song play is, of course, where we have the necessary code for processing note presses. In the case of note press, we're doing things like recording the fact that the note was hit. And in this case, we want to make sure that we also turn around and increment our hit count. So we want to say this dot hit count plus plus so that we reflect this note hit also in terms of our hit count total. 
All right, that takes care of hit count. Now we need to set up a new event that we haven't put into play yet. We need to be able to tell when the song ends, because at this point you've noticed in all of our play tests, whenever we hit the end of the song, the staff continues sliding indefinitely. We mm -hmm. never actually advance past the song. And in order to advance, we're going to set up the ended event. Of course, back here in song, we had set up this event called ended, which was meant to be fired as soon as we reach the end of a specific song. So what we'll do is inside of song play, we'll add some code to our tick method in order to detect that we have hit the end of a song. So the code that's going to be used for detection will be an if statement, where we say if our notes dot count is greater than zero. The reason we're doing this is in case uh, down the road we're going to have our uh, editing mode. Mm -hmm. And editing mode, if you start off with a blank song, would have no notes in it. We don't want to fire off the ended event in case that there are zero notes. We'll let the staff play indefinitely okay. in that case. So we'll make sure that uh, another way to look at it is in order to detect the end of the song, we need to look at where the last note in the song is placed. And if there's no notes, we can't look at the last note. Gotcha. So we need to have notes in order to look at notes. So we'll say that if our note count is greater to zero, than zero, then we'll check our cursor and see if it's greater than or equal to the position of the last note. So here is this dot cursor that is greater than or equal to notes dot count. Now we're looking at our note. Let's think about this for a second before we drop it in. We need to look at the last note in the notes list. So what we'll do is we'll look at the notes list and address the element that is notes.count minus one, or rather the last addressable element. Mm -hmm. So this is notes sub notes dot count minus one. But the cursor itself is actually measured in ticks. Right, so we can drop in and grab right. the tick of that specific note. Which, which that's the value that can actually be compared against cursor. Now rather than ending immediately on the last note, let's give a little bit of room so that the song plays just a little bit past the end. And we'll set up a value of this dot quarter note. So we'll go one quarter note past the current tick. Mm -hmm. Now if that's the case, if we've run into a scenario where we find that we are one quarter note past the last note, then we will invoke the end event. We'll do this using the trigger end method. So we'll call this dot trigger end. And that takes care of our detection. Now we do want to make sure that we, if we trigger the end, that we immediately stop the song at that point. So we'll actually put this together in the form of an is, uh, if else statement. So we will only advance the cursor if the song has not reached the end. Mm -hmm. That way, the moment we hit end, we can rely on the fact that we stop at that specific tick. All right, now that we have an ended event, we can turn our attention to the game screen and begin using that event. So we'll go over here and bring up screen game, and then inside of reset, where we're setting up all of our various events, let's set up some events to listen for the ended event. So we'll grab songs sub i dot ended and use plus equal to bring up a new event handler. Let it drop in the new delegate instance and again to drop in the method. Now you'll notice something interesting happened here with our naming. Up until now the event handlers have gotten the name of song underscore then the name of the event. Mm -hmm. Now all of a sudden we're getting screen game instead of song. And just as a matter of preference, I'm going to change this over to song. The reason it's not matching the name is earlier this name was being gathered because the instance we were grabbing from was called song. Right. Here we're looking at song's I, which means the actual song instance itself doesn't really have a name. It's just part of a, mm -hmm. an element in an array. So instead we jumped a layer past and grabbed the whole game. Now I do like the song underscore structure for our naming. So I'm going to hit F2 and rename the identifier to song underscore ended. That'll pick up both the, the definition and the method itself. Again, that's just a matter of preference, but it does keep our naming unified across all of our events. Okay. So 
inside of our song ended handler, now we're free to go ahead and calculate the specific score. Also keep in mind that this song ended handler will end up getting called twice in multiplayer since we'll have two song instances that are both pointing at the same handler. But that's that's useful in our case because that gives us the opportunity to calculate player 1's score when the song for player 1 hits and player 2's score when that song hits. Now let's put together the score calculation itself. So what we'll do is let's look at the scores field. So we'll grab global state dot scores. Now of course we need to address a specific element in that scores array and we'll address that using the incoming player belonging to the song. So we can drop in song dot player index and that way we'll address the appropriate score field. Then we'll turn around and set that to their floating point score. Now in order to calculate the score again we're going to divide the notes that they did hit against the total number of notes. So that is song dot hit count divided by song dot notes dot count. Now we do want to get this value back in terms of a floating point so we're going to cast the first field over to float before running the operation. Mm -hmm. That way we'll get a, a floating point value of in the range of 0 to 1, where 1 would be 100% of the notes, and 0 would be no notes hit. Okay. And we'll get some floating point in between, depending on the score that they got. Alright, now we want to do a check. As soon as we calculate the score, we can turn around and show the actual score screen. So we can do a screen dot push screen, so that we can show the score screen. Once we show the score screen, we'll turn around and call reset on score just in case it needs to do any type of internal initialization. So that's screen dot active screen dot reset. Now with that, that's all making sense. So we'll get in here and calculate the appropriate player, then invoke the score screen and get the score screen ready to show. Now let's test the game at this point just to make sure that our song end code is working properly. So we could jump into for now, single player, grab the 2x bass song, let it play through its series of measures. So we get to the end of the fourth measure, end of the song, and then we get the score screen being shown. So all seems to be working well. But what happens if we were to load this in multiplayer? So we'll do the same thing, load up the song, let it play through. So we get to the end. And it seems to have worked, we get to the score screen, but, looking down here at the bottom, we get an error message in the log saying that we attempted to push score, which is already on the stack. Let's see. Which, that's interesting. The reason we're getting this error message is because, once again, song ended is going to get called twice in multiplayer. Both songs are going to end up invoking this event. And we are calling score inside of that. We need to do a check and make sure that we only push the score screen once. In order to do that, we'll only push the score screen in the case of the handler for song element 0. So we'll do that by checking the current song and making sure that its player index is equal to 0. That way we will still invoke the score screen in single player, because we'll be using player 0. But in multiplayer, only the handler for song 0 is going to invoke the actual screen. And then, since we need to test this a few times, um, just to make this a little bit easier, uh, as we're listening to it, I'm actually going to comment out the playback to make it easier to talk over the sound of the song playing back. And I'm also going to shorten the length of the song. For the time being, we'll comment out our song uh, library loading. I'll put the beat generator back in. We'll drop in beat 2 with only two measures. So we have a song that will go by very quickly. Though inside of the beat generator, we will need to address the songs sub i instead of song. So now if we test again in multiplayer, we should no longer be dropping in the score screen twice. So we jump down multiplayer. We should have a sh uh, shorter song to play through. And then we get to the score screen and we no longer have any error message. Now at this point, there is one last thing to test. And that is, if we try and use the replay method, watch what happens. If we hit replay, 
it doesn't appear that anything is, is actually happening. We can do change song and get back and play through. So we'll let the song play out. But once we get here to replay, no matter how many times I hit select on replay, it seems to no longer work. Mm. So we need to figure out why that might be. The reason is we have, at this point, when we call the song ended, we get over to the score screen, our songs are still at their last tick. That meant if we were to go from the score screen, re-push the game screen, we would end up in a scenario where our songs are still sitting at the last tick, which means we'd get in here to update, we'd call song.tick, we'd get into song play, play through the end of tick, and notice the fact that, hey, wait a minute, we're still on the ending tick of the song. Well, we need to fire off our end event then. And back into the game screen, back into our end event, and what happens in end? Well, we show score. And since all of this happens within the span of a single tick, we don't actually see anything on screen. We hit score and wrap right back around to push screen for score. Mm -hmm. So what we need to do to fix this, since we do want to be able to jump back away from the score screen back into the game, is we need to make sure that our songs get reset. So all we'll do is call song.reset. And we don't have to worry about addressing a specific one since, again, each, this method will get called twice in multiplayer. The correct song will get passed in. So that means both songs will end up getting reset. So now if we run, jump into single player or multiplayer, and let everything play out to the end, then we get to the score screen. We can hit replay, and this score, the game will begin again from the beginning. And all the notes got reset. Again, they reappeared to be pressed. So both replay and change song are now working again. So at this point, we can now turn our attention to the score screen because we should be recording numbers into this scores float. Now we need to display those on screen. Now before we jump into the drawing code on score, let's first bring up our style settings here in style.xml and let's set up two different things. We need to set up a color for the scores to be drawn using. So we'll jump up here to the color section, look for text score, and set that to a value of 128, 171, 255. So we'll have a light blue color that we'll use for drawing our scores. Now we also need to have the position of the score information on the screen. So here in our positions value, we'll look for score players and we'll set that to a value of 482 by 209. All right, with these in place, we can now jump over to the score screen. So we'll scroll down here to our menu section, bring up screen score, and now we're ready to display score information. We'll jump in here right before the draw menu item method, and we will override the base draw method. Since earlier we didn't have to worry about overriding draw because we were only using menu elements, well here inside of the score screen we have some some information to draw that is in addition to the actual menu. So we'll still retain our code base which means we'll get things like the background drawn, we'll get our base code in the menu system which will get our menu items drawn, but we're still free to override draw ourselves to give additional base drawing code. So what we need to do inside of draw is we need to set up a loop that will loop through all of the players currently playing the game. That means one iteration in single player and two iterations in multiplayer. So we'll put together a for loop. So we'll grab four, hit tab, bring up the template, jump over to our number of iterations to run, and we'll plug in global state dot num players. So that way we'll have a loop set up and we'll loop over the appropriate number of players. Now inside of this loop we need to gather the score information for the current player inside of the loop and then draw that player's score to the screen. So the first thing we'll do is we'll make a string variable called text. And we'll, let's put together a uh, string using some string formatting to say something along the lines of uh, player 1 has a certain percentage and then possibly player 2 has a certain percentage. Okay. So we'll do this using string.format. For the format string, we'll put in player, and then we'll drop in argument zero. We'll say that that player got a score of argument one. 
Now there will be some additional formatting we'll do to the score itself because right now the score is a decimal and zero to one. Right, it's a zero to one value. But we'll address that once we get all of our drawing code in place. So that's the basic format. Player whatever got score whatever. Now for argument zero, which is the player themselves, we'll take i, but we'll offset it by one. Because the number of players is, is a zero based list. Exactly, and our loop here is a zero based loop going through that. So instead of play, saying player zero and player one, we'll say player one and player two. Now we need to drop in the appropriate score for this player. So we'll look into global state, look at our scores field, and address scores sub i. So we'll let our loop address the appropriate score element. All right, now that we've got the text that we'll use to draw to the screen, we need to figure out where on screen this text will go. And in order to do that, we'll make sure we measure the text first so we can space it appropriately. So we'll make a vector 2. We'll call this text dims for text dimensions. And just like we had done in other menus, we'll set up a scenario where we use the font to measure the size of this text string. So we'll look into style in order to grab where do we there we go, style, so that we can address font large. Font large will be used to measure the string, and we'll plug text into the measure string call. All right, in addition to text dimensions, we also need the position of the text, and we need to begin at the location of this um, score setting. Of course, in style.xml, we had set up a specific location for the score information to be shown, so let's copy that out into a vector two here. We'll make a vector two called position. We'll set that to be equal to style positions dot score players. Now we need to turn around and as we walk element by element, offset this so that we move down the screen as we draw the different players. So we'll take our positions y value and we will increment that by a value of i times the text dimensions in Y. So that way each time we move down in the loop, we'll move down an entire line's height. We'll also give an additional spacing of 1.5, just like we did on the main menu. So we have half a line's height in between each actual line. All right, now that we've got position information ready to go, let's turn around and draw this information to the screen. So we will call on our sprite batch, tell it to draw a string. We will draw using the large font, which is style.fontlarge. For the text, we'll plug in the text variable. For position, we'll plug in the position variable. And for color, we'll look into style colors and drop in text score. All right, with our drawing code in place now, we should be ready to jump in and try it out. So let's grab multiplayer, and then we'll jump into the... Actually, at this point, we do have one thing we'll have to clean up. If we try jumping into any of these songs, mm -hmm. remember we have that temp um, beat generator yeah. being put in place. So even 6-8 time is actually still that Same original song. beat, too. So if we hit a few notes, we see that... Oh, you outscored me. I got a score of 0 0.2148, so on, and you got a score of 0 0.107, so on. I wasn't ready. So now, in order to draw this in a more readable, friendly format, let's draw this as a percentage rather than as a decimal. <laughs> what do you mean? What's wrong with a score like that? Surely everyone will be fine with a score like that. Let's see. Here in our score screen, let's change the formatting. So here where we're setting up our uh, string format... Argument 1 is the score, so let's specify some additional information. So we'll have argument 1 colon 0 percent sign. So that way we'll use percent based formatting. Okay. So now if we jump in and run, we can grab multiplayer. Again, we'll be using that pre-generated beat. We can jump in here and say, yeah, we both got 43%. If I can figure out what the orange button was supposed to be on this I controller. I think it's the, uh, that shoulder? Okay, well, shoulder? I hope so, because I don't have enough fingers to hit it at the other... You know. So, little jam session, and... Ah, very good. There you go. I was only hitting it, like, every fourth time, though, so I still <laughs> suck. 
but now we can see we've got scores of 46% and 57%. So one, this is a more useful number because just if you were practicing a song, you can now see how well you did on the song. If you get 100% on the song, you got all the notes. Mm -hmm. So that is working very well. Now, before we end things off, we do want to make sure we remember to go back to our game screen and remove our temporary generation code. Let's comment out the beat generator and replace our full um, song load file call. Gotcha. So with that now, we have our score system fully in place. We have our game screen calculating score and our score screen displaying score. So that is going to wrap up this video.